This is Bob Singleton, Executive Director of the Greater Story Historical Society with the Marine Air Terminal at LaGuardia Airport, a virtual tour. Sponsored by the Greater Story Historical Society, November 4th, 2022. And on the left, we see the beautiful rotunda of the Marine Air Terminal. We'll be seeing that a few times. On our programs, we show an advisory since some of the material may belong to other people. Um, we ask that if you use anything in the, that you see in this program, please get in touch with us first. Um, some of it is, is a material that does have restrictions on it. Um, the owners would like to have people uh, ask them for permission to use some of this material, or they'd just like to know that you are using the material. So please do get in touch with us at Astoria, L-I-C, at gmail.com. First page is from a very important event in the history of LaGuardia Airport. It's opening ceremony on Sunday, October 15th, 1939. And on the opening program, we find this image and these words. At that time, it was called the New York Municipal Airport. And it's an interesting bit of poetry from Tennyson. For I dip into the future, as far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. Saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic cells, pilots of the purple twilight, dropping down with costly bells. To uh, start this program, we uh, would like to uh, thank um, a couple of entities and also give a little background information. The first being the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which owns LaGuardia Airport. Established in 1921, uh, it is 101 years old. It is a regional transportation infrastructure uh, that includes bridges, tunnels, airports, seaports. Um, it's headquartered at the World Trade Center, and it operates so many different um, features within this area, everything from Port Newark, Elizabeth Marine Air Terminal, to uh, the, the crossings between New Jersey and New York, the Port Authority Bus Terminal, Path Rail System, including LaGuardia Airport, JFA Airport, Newark, and other airports within the area. The LaGuardia entry on um, Wikipedia uh, describes it as being the third busiest airport in the New York area after JFK and Newark. Um, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in 2015 announced a multi-billion dollar reconstruction of the airport's passenger infrastructure, expected to be complete by 2025. And finally, the wiki entry for the Marine Air Terminal or Terminal A. Um, it is a beautiful structure designed by uh, in Art Deco style by William Delano, Delano and Aldrich. It's opened in 1940. And originally it was built to handle the Pan Am's fleet of flying boats and the Boeing Clippers, which landed on nearby Bowery Bay. After World War II, the Clippers were obsolete and the terminal was renovated and found other uses. And in this discussion, which is going to center around the terminal, we are going to not only outline its history, but perhaps suggest some ideas for its future. The best place to start is to take a look at a series of pictures done by um, the photographer William Hoff. Um, most of his work was done in the 1930s. Um, and he sort of okay, sort of uh, puts down in, in, in images the, the early years of the airport from the time it was established as a, as a major transport hub through um, the day-by-day -day operations. We have almost no information on him. Uh, there is one photo of a William Hoff, who's probably the uh, photographer, uh, at the controls of a rather 
primitive airplane, probably circa 1910 or so, from, uh, from looking at the, uh, the apparatus behind 1910, 1915. But he took a series of pictures. There's about uh, almost 50 of them. There's, they're numbered from number 50 through somewhere in the 90s. We don't have a complete collection. Um, there's a number of places on the website where you can um, take a look at his, his collections. Um, and what this is, is basically a composite of the of the images that we know. We start out with an imaginary trip uh, of somebody in the in the 1940. And uh, his first step would be to uh, somebody who is used to, say, taking the railroad. Um, we want to travel long distances, whether it's on business or for pleasure. Um, there's an interesting building right across from Grand Central Station, the Airlines Terminal. Park Avenue at 42nd Street. It was built in 1941, um, and it stood until 1978. And I think a lot of its um, purpose was to entice people onto the uh, air airplanes as a form of travel. And when you walked into this facility, you knew immediately you were someplace special. Beautiful Art Deco design, soaring ceilings, rotundas surrounded with all kinds of images. And you see this environment uh, from the moment you step into the system until you get to LaGuardia or even a Marine Air Terminal. And we'll see images of this when we get to the airport. So here now we are going to go on a trip. So we see the check-in place here. We go outside. Uh, under another beautiful mural, and there is a limo waiting to take us to the airport through Queens Midtown Tunnel, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, or Grand Central Parkway. All transportation um, features that are very new, built in the 1930s. And so we arrive at what's called the Land Plane Administration Building. There are two administration buildings. One is Land Plane and the other is the Marine Air Terminal, which does the flying boats, which lands on water. And you can see a beautiful trim looking building on top of it is it looks like a picture of uh, a flying uh, a eagle or some, some sort, beautiful art deco style, very clean. There's a police officer. And we go on the inside and we see an interior very similar to the space that's in Manhattan. This is the administration building. And you can see airline information. So you come right in, you're already in this enchanted world. And all around on the edge, it looks like um, um, almost like trophies uh, or, or, or trays with uh, flames coming out of them. It must have been quite an experience to be able to um, uh, travel on an airplane for the first time in this period. It looks magical at night. Very few offices uh, have uh, lights on. Uh, a handful of cars outside. Almost you could hear the crickets, something you could not hear today at LaGuardia. But at this period of time, at the very, very early years of flight, um, things were just getting started. Now, we have a series of pictures of uh, taken probably from an airplane uh, of the airport. Um, this is the uh, administration building, the terminal building. These are hangars. And here you can see the planes lined up, ready for people to embark on them or to disembark after they've just arrived at a trip. And you can see the runways in the background. Here are cars, maybe the employees, or perhaps it's people that let a, left a car here and went on a trip and you know came back a few days later. I don't know, but it's, it's really interesting to see a lot of activity here. And this looks like a series of cabs, perhaps, are waiting to take people back into the city. LaGuardia Airport was designated as the aviation of tomorrow. Even at its earliest times, by 1940, it was 250 scheduled arrivals and departures daily. Um, you have the land plane hangars, which are these buildings. There were, th there were six of them originally. They were larger than Madison Square Garden. This seaplane hangar right here, larger than two football fields. 
It had four runways. Today it has two, but at this time it had four runways, um, two of which were over a mile long. 23,000 people were involved in the construction of this in 1940, this, this airport. And its cost in today's money would be nearly a billion dollars. And I believe this is opening day. Um, there's no indication from the uh, somewhat bland description that it's merely a view of the administration building and promenade, but it looks like it's a reviewing stand here. It looks like there are people uh, that are seated here, and it looks like the airplanes are sort of lined up uh, almost in parade. And here's the promenade that people could have both dine and could also uh, stand to watch their friends board the plane or arrive. Interesting how it's color one, black and white in the other. We have a series of, uh, we were able to match up different pictures like that too. Um, this is the lineup at night. And again, you have a handful of airplanes uh, ready to take off. Some of them, I, I think there was no flying um, in the wee hours of the morning, but planes did take off after dark and they would have sleeper lounges when you'd get to a, a transverse point. Um, and, you know, you would wake up the next morning uh, ready to land, you know, in, in California. So um, there was there was 24 seven uh, flying. Even at this early time and another so almost homespun aspect of this is that it looks like these planes were sort of worked on, you know, uh, when a plane would land, the mechanic would get into the, you know, take the cowling off, start to, you know, look at everything and see everything was 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 operational. Um, and so they have regular, of course, regular maintenance, especially now that the public is involved here. Um, and here's a plane just tuning up right at the uh, right at the airport, um, ready to take on passengers in a couple of minutes. And here's another, the Stratoliner. We'll talk about some of the names of these planes. They had fabulous names. This is a transcontinental airline, Stratoliner. And so again, the, the engines are getting all warmed up, ready to take off. And you can see some sort of device down there that's monitoring the gauge of the uh, making sure that everything is ship shape in the plane now this was this was a an interesting era for flight travel you realize that uh, up until this time people had deluxe co you know coach and trains and um, very wealthy people would would take trains and they had a certain degree of um, service that they expected it would become sleeping accommodations food accommodations or reading accommodations and that um, that spirit was taken over in the early years of flight because they were catering to the same elite at that time because very expensive to fly so the restaurants at the airport uh here we have aviation terrace and restaurant the terrace was outside the restaurant inside 1940 after the airport uh, went through its its first major renovation for the modern era. This restaurant was run by the Hotel New Yorker. And if you take a look at the people in here, the, the men are in suits, the women have uh, pearls, and hats on, uh, food is being, uh, you know, uh, brought in by a, a, a tuxedoed uh, weight person. Um, this This was very, very, very high class kind of a, an operation. And I guess the airlines felt if they could start to win over the people, because again, up until this time, flight had sort of a barnstormer, kind of a rough kind of a, a, a feel to it. And what you're getting here, you're trying to lure long distance travelers away from a certain level of comfort. And the airlines are very smart to be able to duplicate this almost from the very beginning. Um, an example of the uh, the menu, the Aviation Terrorist Restaurant. And you can see everything there from oysters and clams and appetizers to broiled baby flounder with lemon butter. I mean, every detail uh, was looked at. Interesting, the prices, though. I mean, just add uh, 10 and then maybe uh, add another 10 to get some of the uh, prices uh, that you would have to pay today for this for this food. Um, this would be the outdoor uh, aviation terrace. And so you see a friend was going to take a, a trip, uh, a nice spring day, he'd sit outside, have a meal. And then uh, when the plane would uh, be ready to uh, 
take on passengers. They would simply take down, uh, they would just simply go down the steps, as you can see here, and then go out to the, to the actual runway itself and board the plane directly. We'll see that in a moment here. Um, and once you're on the plane, again, no luxury uh, is forgotten. You know, this uh, title on this is Dinner at 8,000 Feet. Now, that's a mile and a half up. And you're thinking, well, maybe dining would be Spartan. But in the early years of flying, it was top-notch service here by the wait staff, as you can see. And this shows the promenade. So there's the, uh, there's the terrace restaurant. Here's the promenade. And there's the ramps where people get on. Here looks like a group of people are ready to get on the plane. That observation deck, as I noted here, was a mile and a quarter long. I talked to people that as late as the 60s, people from around the area, would actually go to the airport to watch the airplanes land and take off. It was quite a quite an experience. You didn't have to uh, have a, a ticket to, to get to the observation deck that was open to the public. Again, this was a place where they wanted the public to become familiar with and comfortable with the concept of flying. Um, here's again interesting the uh, the the photograph and the and the, and the colored um, knockoff postcard um, are very similar in certain aspects and uh, very different in, in others. But here you can see the people just sitting at the tables, you know, standing around and watching people embark on the planes. Here, this is a mainliner by United Airlines. And here you can see the plane ready to taxi and take off. And there's still people standing around outside on the runway. I mean, it's quite a different period of time than you know, it is, uh, you know, today. And here's the main liner taking off. And you can see in the background, there's the Empire State Building. The uh, 1937 the United Airlines promoted their, their airplanes as main liners. Um, it was sort of, so they want to make it synonymous with a new level of luxury in the experience of flying. Um, the mainliners were um, at various configurations. Uh, they were 21 passenger coaches. Planes are small by, by today's standards, 21 passenger coaches. They would have sleepers for folding berths at 14. And that was useful when they would travel the country, they would have four or five stops. There was no coast to coast travel at this time. And you would arrive at a section of your, your trip where it would be at night, and you would transfer to another plane, which would have folding berths, sleepers on them. And the planes also had sky lounges, too. So if you had a, a corporate group that uh, you know, took a, a plane um, and they would have a, you know, an event or something, uh, and, uh, they would have sky lounges so that uh, you could... Uh, so sort of sit back and either read a novel, read a magazine, or chat with your colleagues. So it was, uh, you know, the last word in, in, in luxury. Mainliner in flight. Uh, again, these planes had a range of 1,500 miles. And they were able to get from New York to San Francisco in less than 16 hours, depending upon the winds, if they, the winds were with them. And it only took three stops for them to refuel. The flagship in the air was very similar to the flagship of the fleet, the sea fleet, in that uh, they were transportation vehicles of reliability, efficiency, popularity, and longevity. Everything going for them. These are the model that represented the company that owned them. And here we have, again, a flagship flying over LaGuardia Airport. Quite an interesting picture. And there in the background, you can see the name of the airport was spelled out. The American Airlines, um, because they decided to take the risk, bite the bullet, and you know, step up to LaGuardia and say, we would like to support you um, and run our service at, the, at this airport. Uh, he, he saw that they were given the privilege to operate the world's first airline lounge called the Admiral's Club. Now, initially, it was invitation only, but they soon opened up the uh, the doors to uh, accepting anybody that would, would pay dues for it. 
uh, a rare picture of the uh, pilots in the cockpit of the, of the plane, the DC-3. Um, but as I said, it required 16 hours and a couple of stops to cross the United States from coast to coast. See these cramped conditions. Imagine flying in these planes for hours on end um, and having all these uh, instruments in front of you and just keeping your eyes open, watching everything. Um, this is a Stratoliner, a little bit more complex. That uh, This plane uh, had distinction of flying above the clouds. It was the first fully pressurized airliner. And the, the, the benefit of being at 20,000 feet as opposed to, say, five or 10,000 is that you miss a lot of the bad weather. It's called flying above the weather. But to be able to do that, because oxygen was kind of you know thin in, in that level, the airplanes had to be pressurized. Uh, so there was almost like, the, you know, sort of closed off to the outside. Um, and they also had uh, additional crew members, too. These planes had 33 passengers. Most of the other planes had like something like 25 passengers. Um, and they did have a, a, a wide cabin for overnight berths. Um, and it was also the first airplane to, to get a flight engineer because there was so much to monitor on this airplane that um, they needed a, a third set of eyes to watch all the you know gauges and everything because sometimes it you know they take the the, the 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 fuel from the from the right tank and then to balance it they would shut that valve and then take the fuel from the left tank and they'd be continuously doing this throughout the the trip and it would be the the role of the uh, you know, at the the first officer, so to be able to to sort of watch these things and actually work on this, and even spot the pilots if uh, the pilots wanted to sort of take a break because they must have been really cramped, really stressful to fly up there. Um, then uh, you know they would you know sort of sort of sit in, um, but if there was any problems or anything like that, of course, it was always the pilot and co-pilot was in in the in the seats. Be, by the way, the, this this. The 307, Boeing 307, was the sister to the Boeing 299, which became the B-17 Flying Fortress. So it was really interesting, a, a sort of a spinoff of this rush to, uh, you know, develop uh, flying um, was the fact that the, uh, the U.S. military uh, really would enjoyed a lot of benefits uh, from uh, the, the, the rapid uh, increase in, in uh, the flying in, in this country. And that the flying the flying fortress was one of the outstanding uh, long range bombers of the war. Very very tough airplane. Um, this aircraft in 1937 cost three hundred thousand dollars, which in today's money would be like so, over seven million, almost eight million dollars. Going to give you an idea. Each plane, there were a lot of tickets had to be sold for these guys to pay themselves off. And this is a, a really interesting. Uh, a destination list in about 1940 showing New York to various points from Dallas to Miami to Vancouver. Um, took anywhere from 15 hours for a 2800 route map, a, a ride, to uh, two hours to go up to Montreal, which is less than 400, 400 miles. And interesting, the Great Silver Fleet. The Eastern Airlines Great Silver Fleet, which is a, a logo that they had for many, many years, uh, already had their Atlanta hub because uh, Atlanta was discovered to be sort of equal distance from Houston, Miami, Washington, New York, and Chicago. Here's the Stratoliner. Um, near the control tower, banking near the control tower. And as you can see, from New York to Los Angeles, um, there were eight intermediate steps. Uh, Washington, Dallas, El Paso, Phoenix. Um, and if they took off in the evening, they, they would actually change planes at night to go to a sleeper uh, in Memphis. So uh, they when they arrived for business or to meet family or friends on the West Coast, they were refreshed in the morning having slept on the plane throughout the night. Um, this is an interesting statistic, and and this is one of the most fascinating things I that I found out when I when I worked on on this project. That the just twenty five hundred miles, you know, I've been on the plane, of course, from from New York to the to the West Coast, San Francisco, Los Angeles, 
it was about four and a half, five, five and a half hours, depending on the wind, because, you know, you got the wind blows in one direction and it slows the plane up if the plane's going into the wind. Um, but in 1939, that same trip would take about 16 hours. It would take four times as long. Now, you can imagine how long that would be by today's standards. I mean, you'd be cramped. But that was a huge improvement because only five years earlier, they were breaking the barrier at 26 miles in 1934. And since we realized that, you know, this flying really started about 1930 or so, in the 20s, people were taking trains across the country. And in that, you measured a trip in terms of days, a couple of days. So to go from a couple of days to uh, 16 hours, you know, in a space of, uh, you know, 10 years, <laughs> it was a huge, huge improvement in in flight. Um, the there there was routes to Latin America at this time from the United States, but uh, the only regular service uh, to LaGuardia was the Canadian Colonial Sir, uh, Airways, which was uh, in in 1929 uh, from Montreal. And uh, Canadian Colonial was was absorbed later by Eastern Airlines, and there's a whole line of. Uh, Canadian colonial planes lined up. So now we're going to change uh, our focus and talk about the um, seaplane base in the foreground. It's this building right here. And we're going to talk a little bit. There, there's, the, there's the terminal for the seaplane. Okay, now we're going to talk about a little bit about how they were able to operate the, the, the planes. You go inside and immediately see something that looks familiar because the lobby of the Marine Air Terminal, the round desk, is very similar to the lobby of the seaplane terminal, the seaplane administration building, and also very similar to the um, facility in Manhattan, uh, the, the station in Manhattan where you would board the the, uh, the limos to come out to the airport. To the airport here, designed in 1940 by Delano Aldrich, which was a, a famous architectural firm, uh, declared a New York City landmark in 1980, National Register of Historic Places in 1982, uh, and also um, uh, it's uh, on it's uh, is a designated as a historic site uh, by the government. The hangar for seaplanes, which is next to the main building, was converted for a garage for snow removal vehicles. So this building is still standing today, but it's a garage for maintenance for snow removal at the airport. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how the planes were launched. This is a, a, a clipper, and it was being brought outside, being towed from its hangar, and there's an undercarriage under it, and there's, a, I guess, a cable between the two. And what they would do then is to, um, to take the plane over to a long uh, ramp that went into the water. And once the underbody of the, the plane was in the water, they would disconnect the, uh, uh, the device under it, the wheels under it, uh, and the plane would be free floating. So we're going to see that in a moment here. So... Here is the plane. There, the ramp is over here, and here's the plane. And what it does, it taxis over to this pier, where people can leave the terminal, walk across this ramp in Bowery Bay. This is Bowery Bay, and uh, board the, the plane here. And then the plane would simply detach itself, and then uh, taxi along the Bowery Bay rev the engines up until it finally became airborne. And we'll have a series of pictures like that in a moment. By the way, this is the ramp where they would uh, tow the uh, the plane into the water. This looks like a uh, another event here of opening up the Marine Air Terminal because it's, it's similar to the pictures we had before of the, um, the main building where you have people on the runway. Incidentally, that's Grand Central Parkway there. And you can see it's only a couple of lanes and very, very sparse traffic. Well, Come back to this a few decades later. It's going to look very, very different, as you can imagine. So here it is. You're uh, you're watching your friends embark, and uh, they're ready to uh, close the door, and uh, rev up the engines on the plane. 
and uh, then head out into Bowery Bay. Okay. And there's a really nice series of pictures here of the airplane taking off. It must have been really something uh, in its day to hear this airplane take off and hear that as it courses its way through the water, becoming airborne. So this is the start. Here you can see the front of the airplane is already off the water, only just the tails dragging. And here you see the plane is a completely airborne in flight. And the last picture in this series shows the uh, seaplane returning from flight, and it's just basically the reverse of, of the takeoff. I uh, talk a little bit about the history of uh, the area. Um, and I came up with an interesting uh, name for this section of the program from spillway to midway to runway. And we go through an early history of the area uh, before it became an, an airport. And it's a very, very interesting, very, very colorful history. Um, in the upper right corner shows, gives you an idea of what the area looked like when those Native Americans lived here. There's archaeological digs. We do know that there were encampments here. Uh, the water was so rich that people could literally put a basket into it and uh, it'd be full of fish. And uh, the, 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 the clams were literally the size of dinner plates. I mean, it was literally, it was, it was like really a Garden of Eden. In, in, in that sense. And, and the camps would move every couple of years. They would move to a different location. So they'd be here at Bowery Bay, then they'd go over to Astoria Cove, and then maybe down to Long Island City, and then maybe over to, you know, Elmhurst, what have you. So it, it was, you know, we've done, as I said, we've done dugs, digs in the area and they've discovered evidence, uh, abundant evidence of Native American habitation. The next one in the upper right is the um, when the area was still natural, but at this point, the European colonists had moved in and found new uses for the area, one of them being tide mills. Uh, there was a stream, this was Jackson Creek, that ran here, it uh, poured into Bowery Bay, poured into the East River. The tide mills really saved New York, because up until this time, nobody could figure out how the colony could make any money for anybody. It was so far away from anything that was considered important. So somebody came up with the idea and said, well, you got lots of land here. And we got lots of hungry people in England because the farm people were leaving, working and going into factories. So the idea was you build the boats, you know, you 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 sow the crops, you mill, you, you get the wheat, make it flour, put it in barrels, we'll take it to Europe on your boats, and those boats will come back filled with manufactured goods. Folks, it was a success. To this day, that was is commemorated in the New York City coat of arms. You will see two barrels on the coat of arms. Those are flower barrels. And a lot of what saved New York were places like this mill right here. It spills around until um, about the time of the American Civil War. It was still milling, milling uh, flour. This was the third step. This was the um, amusement park run by the Steinways. It had different names, Bowery Bay, North Beach, Gala Amusement Park. And this was the pier at Sanford Point. And again, this is the creek where they had the tide mills. And this is the LaGuardia Airport uh, when it first opened in 1940. This is the Marine Air Terminal. There's the, um, the main building. And there's the various runways. So the four faces of LaGuardia Airport. And anytime there's any, any project today, um, they will... Um, make a uh, survey of the area's history. Um, and so we do have from this, when they when they did the archeological survey report for this latest building project, um, they did discover evidence of Native American presence, uh, which is uh, listed in the section to the left. And on the right was an interesting map, uh, which showed the where the tide mill was and, and the old colonial road. Um, and there's the pond, the Jackson Mill, and the outline is the um, area of the, uh, the amusement park and the very earliest uh, air, air, airport. Of course, it's now much bigger than that today, but it kind of gives you an idea of how the area has changed. And I got some more. I've got some more maps in here too. Uh, fabulous postcard showing the the uh, this we think is the mill house, and this was where the tide mill was, and this was the pond tide mill. Sixteen sixty eight was the foundation. 
and uh, had different names, Kipps Bay, Fisher's Mill, Jackson's Mill. And uh, it operated until 1870 and was torn down in the 1880s. Next uh, step in terms of development was the Steinwegs. The Steinwegs were very, very wealthy. They made pianos. Uh, nobody had records in those days. Nobody had uh, any kind of electronic devices. Uh, the only way you could listen to music was you had to pay it or pay somebody to play it. And so they made a tremendous amount of money. They did not have enough space in Manhattan. So they came out to Queens and, um, you know, they, they had socialist leanings, uh, which is perfectly fine because they were great business people also. And they uh, decided to uh, put in housing, model housing, and attracted uh, other businesses besides their piano. There was a silk works there. They had stores, a post office, everything. And in, in this area in blue, the Steinway, still called the Steinway neighborhood. And then they also bought land to the immediate right in this picture, the next peninsula out there, which was called Bowery Bay. And there they put an amusement park. And since they took over the lines, the roads and turnpikes and trolleys and everything to get to their, their community, they made twice as much money because now the trolleys not only went to their community, but also was filled with people uh, that went out to uh, this amusement park. And uh, they named it North Beach Park. Uh, this is a topographical map from 1890. This, again, is Jackson Mill Creek. There's the, there's the, there's the, bird, the title mill right there. This is where North Beach Park was. That's called Sansford Point that stuck out. Okay, this would be the approximate location of the Marine Air Terminal right about here, because this was Bowery Bay. And this red streak here would be the approximate location of Grand Central Parkway. So, you know, you come up from Flushing and then you make that turn as you're going towards Manhattan. So the, the road would be approximately like this. And there you can see the Steinway, the settlement that they put in for their community. Um, quickly, we get, we talk about North Beach, Steinway, Long Island. It's going to give you a flavor of what the area looked like. This is key because, you see, to get to this park, they had to put in a network of streetcars and 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 um, you know and and turnpikes and roads and stuff. So when the airport was 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 conceived, it already was part of a fabulous road structure that uh, gave access out to Long Island, uh, the rest of Queens and Manhattan, Bowery Bay Beach. So that's going out to the the amusement park along Flushing Avenue, which today is called Astoria Boulevard. OK, and it's in different names, Bowery Bay, then later North Beach. And then at the end, it was known as Gala Amusement Park. And it shows the people enjoying themselves. Uh, people didn't really swim that much in those days. Women walked around with very, very heavy clothes, even in the summer. Uh, and those of you familiar with the General Slocum shipping disaster, uh, many women drowned when the ship went down because they didn't know how to swim. And they had this encumbrance of all this heavy clothes that was just was water waterlogged. This is what mostly, and mostly it was guys, young guys, would go out in the water and just wade inside the water. Um, and that was pretty much it in terms of water water access. There was a point, this was Sanford's point, which would be about this location, somewhere along this this uh, this, this shore here in a modern map. Um, quick look at one of the rides they had there. They had amusement rides. They also, it's a great place for political clubs and various, uh, you know, various organizations and churches and what have you to so spend a day there and, and rent a space and have a picnic there. And it was heavily German was, was the, was the feeling of the place. And that was actually later led to its downfall because after World War I, um, people were not into Oompa music. The German culture even though they're the largest ethnic group in the country, um, decided this, this the music changed and people were listening to like ragtime music and stuff. They weren't listening to oompa music by uh, by bands. So that kind of culture, that kind of image really changed a lot. And there's also prohibition too. So the, the, the park and, and the Steinways had passed away. The, the original William Steinway had passed away about, um, about 1900. And so this really became a, a white elephant. And uh, when they were looking for an airport, uh, the area immediately uh, came to mind and was converted to an airport. And there was this North Beach Airport. And this is the first airport. You just had a few hangars here, three small runways, 
okay? Um, and even then, you still had like the, the rest of the community was edging into this place. Uh, it wasn't completely uh, obliterated uh, for a couple of years. But here, see, there's, there's again, the Grand Central Parkway, Astoria Boulevard. So this area was very convenient to, um, you know, transportation. Some of the buildings remained after it uh, became an airport. Uh, this is one of the pavilions. Uh, some of them were, were became garages. Others were, were uh, waiting places for people that, you know, booked flights or something like that. So uh, it's, it's an interesting transition between an amusement park and, and an airport. Uh, there was a time where it was sort of a little of both. Um, and then we have this sign from 1930 where uh, North Beach became Glen Curtis Airport. And I'll explain something about Glen Curtis here. I'll get back to the other one. Glen Curtis was an aviation pioneer, a fabulous person uh, who was very imaginative and creative um, he started actually with motorcycling and he went into uh, the air industry. Um, he won the first world's first international air meet at France and made the first long distance flight in the United States. He started a company um, and up to the years leading up to World War One, he was the uh, he worked with the U.S. Army and Navy trying to develop aircraft that would be useful for their um, for their their needs. Uh, and also was the first person to really start building uh, seaplanes. Um, uh, his aircraft was uh, used by the military uh, up until World War II. Uh, the Curtis Jenny was a standard, standard training for uh, general purpose aircraft for the, uh, for the military. Um, and the Curtis flying boat um, made the first flight across the Atlantic Ocean in 1919. Now, folks, remember, the first flight was 1903. Well, 1919, they're already flying across the Atlantic Ocean. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, on the opening day at the airport, uh, since he was, he, you know, he, th this was a tribute to him in, in his memory. Eleanor Roosevelt was uh, had showed up as a, uh, uh, and Charles Lindbergh were there for the first day. By the way, I saw Charles Lindbergh back in the in the early seventies walking down Midtown. Very tall, thin guy. You could see him in the middle of a crowd. Absolutely amazing to be able to say, I saw, you know, Charles Lindbergh. The Pro -tri Trimotor aircraft was involved in mail delivery. This was an interesting way the government kind of subsidized the aircraft industry um, in that they set up a, an airmail system so that, you know, towns were, which would be, you know, cut off from a flood or towns that were take two or three days to, you know, cross a desert to get to. An airplane could be there in a matter of hours, and they would have places where they would just drop sacks at the air at the, uh, the they would show up at an arrive time. The postmaster would be outside of this is uh, this building, and the plane would fly low, and it just literally just dropped the the mail sack out of the airplane. Uh, that's what was done in those days, and most of the time the sack didn't split. But I, I did understand on occasion, it unfortunately did. So now we're going to go on to pioneers of flight. Charles Lindbergh and Anne Morrow Lindbergh, this picture is actually taken on the East River near Bowery Bay. I don't know if it was at the airport itself, but I do recall uh, reading newspapers at that time. And College Point seemed to be a popular place for planes to take off. Now, again, this was not uh, airports. These, these were, were float planes, so they would be in the water. And my guess is, since Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh, his wife, love to travel, love to find, discover new places, um, there was not much places for these airplanes to land. The runways were very, very few and far between. But if you had pontoons on the plane, you could go to a thousand different places in Canada because there were lakes throughout the entire you know, North American continent of, in, in Canada. So I think that was one of the reasons why people chose uh, this area. It was, you know, within the city, you had people that were, you know, knew how to service planes. And these groups would take off and fly, you know, to various destinations. Um, I, I even read once a story of a guy that had a plane and it some of these planes would just start to backed up and they would have to land it. And the guy landed on like 21st Street. Unfortunately, it wasn't built up. 
And he tinkered with the airplane, figured out what the problem was, turned the plane around and took off on 21st Street. And people like, you know, everybody kind of gathered and watched this guy, you know, so you could still do stuff like that at that time. But, you know, as the area became developed, which it did very quickly in the 20s, um, empty spaces like that uh, really no longer existed. Now, Eleanor Smith, Eleanor Smith on a box of Wheaties. Eleanor Smith, and, and there's, a, there's a story about her, pophistorydig.com, Fly Girl East River Bridges. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But Eleanor Smith was the first woman to be on Wheaties. And the next woman to make uh, the box of Wheaties was 50 years later when Mary Lou Retton was on the box of Wheaties in the 1980s. Eleanor Smith is the one person that was my hero from doing this research. I was just absolutely flabbergasted by this woman. You got to hear this story. I got. She had her first flight at the age of six. And when she was up there, she said, she years later, she says, I never returned. She says, I, I just, I knew flying was, was, was my future. She was 10. She was taking flight instructions. She couldn't even reach the, the control. She had to have a pillow in her seat and blocks on the rudder so that she could reach them. By 15, she was doing a first solo flight. And a few months after that, she broke the woman's record at 12,000 feet. I mean, this unbelievable. She got a license a year later. It was signed by Orville Wright. How do you like that, huh? Well, this period of time was uh, post-war, World War I. And there were a lot of pilots that saw a lot of, of stuff you know, um, fighting airplanes. And uh, it, it was, it was, uh, they went through a, a terrible experience, many of them. And they became barnstormers. And, and they, you know, would always put their life on the line doing these tricks and stunts, absolutely crazy stuff. And um, there were, th these guys would hang out in places like, uh, you know, Curtis Field. And um, one of the guys, or uh, some of the guys had uh, started teasing her and they said that, uh, oh, uh, we, we heard you're going to be flying under the East River bridges, but uh, you didn't have, uh, you didn't really have any backbone for you. I guess they, they probably would say, oh, you're just a girl. You know, these guys would be te teasing her and stuff. She didn't say anything. She just sat there, kept her mouth shut. She was 17 at the time. And she said to herself, you know what? I'm going to show these guys. I'm not going to fly under just the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm going to fly under all four bridges, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Williamsburg, and Queensboro. Well, she chose, she did her research. Um, she um, chose the day for her flight. She let the media know about it. She was very disappointed because nobody showed up from the media. And so she was doing an instrument uh, check at the time. And suddenly someone tapped her on the shoulder. And I'll read her narrative. She says, quote, I found myself staring into the face of the world's hero, Charles Lindbergh. He gave me a big smile. He said, good luck, kid. Keep your nose down on the turns. She says, after that, I completed my, my mission without a sweat. They called her the Flying Flapper after that stunt. She pulled all four bridges. And they did a poll of pilots in the 1930s. And they voted her the best woman pilot in America. She beat out Amelia Earhart. She was the first woman, as I said, to appear in the Weedy Box. And it took 50 years for Mary Lou Retton to uh, duplicate that in 1984. She got married, left flying. Uh, but when her husband died in the 50s, she returned back to, to flying. She, start, she started doing things. You know, she had a reputation in, in, in the, in the, within the industry. And she was like piloting a jet trainer. And in 2000, with an all-woman crew, she controlled NASA's space shuttle simulator, becoming the oldest pilot to navigate a simulated shuttle landing. A year later, when she was 89, she was flying experimental aircraft at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. She died in 2010 at the age of 98. I talked to a person who wrote a story about her, this sore Eleanor, and she says, you know, she might have lived in California, but her heart was always in New York on the East River. So, and again, here's a story we have that nobody knows about. 
these this this air this airport this this airport you've got Clarence you've got Eleanor you know it has so much history so many people that I think that if something was put in place a museum a center of some sort or what have you that could inspire a whole new generation of people uh, to to walk in these huge footsteps that these that others have left. But in any case, let's continue our lecture and we'll talk more about that. Maybe just touch a little bit about it a little bit later. Okay, so this is the aerial approach from the Bronx in 1950 of the airport. Um, you can't do this today because this is restricted airspace. You could do something like this, I think, up until like probably the mid 50s. But they, they became so crowded that there was, was very, very tough restrictions on uh, airspace around the uh, around the airport. Um, we're going to talk about pioneers of flight in this section here. We're going to talk about pilots, planes, and, and stuff like this, because there's a lot of history around LaGuardia Airport that was inspired by this location of the airport. Uh, one of them, the flying boats, um, they really grew during the interwar period. Um, it's, it's a shame because they they really never, uh, they were only really used for passenger uh, uh, travel for a few years. And in uh, World War II, hit and then uh, by the end of the war there were already large robust planes that could use the runways um i was always enamored you can see the different boats here the martin mars was something of, of interest uh, personally to me because my father worked at uh, glenn martin in baltimore and he was part of the team that would take these blueprints and make working models and he was always proud in his life he said one of the things that one of the proudest things he did is he said i worked on the largest airplane ever built which was the martin uh mars air aircraft um the planes uh i'll talk a little bit more about them uh, on the next the next slide here um were the, the the planes did have limited service, but they really never caught on. This is a a, a flying boat that made the first regular uh, aviation service, water service, uh, going to Boston in 1929 at the Italian Savonia Marchetti. Uh, it's an interesting model. It was not successful. Um, they usually they ended up. This is the only plane that had a double hull flying boat. Flying boat that was used for commercial purposes. Uh, the next uh, foreign entry was the uh, Donier Du X 1931, the, the, fl the flute ship, flying ship, it was called. Uh, had a crew of 14, and it did its maiden transatlantic flight in 1931. It took 10 months. Now, you know, people say 10 months, you know, well, he, they went down. They, they didn't do a, a direct route like the Americans did. They flew down through Europe, down to Africa, and then over to Brazil, and then up through the Caribbean, and then the East Coast of the United States. So people are thinking that, well, you know, maybe in case another war broke out, they were doing sort of a surveillance of, of what the Atlantic, you know, looked like for uh, for uh, landing places and, you know, what, what the airports were like. That might have been true. I mean, they never admitted it. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the plane landed in Flushing, it was in such a bad shape that uh, they couldn't fly it and took 10 months for them to get all the parts back before they could return back to Germany. And in that period of time, you know, it was it was an expense that they didn't expect. They were living in hotels, and eating food and stuff. So what they would do to try to cover these costs is that they would take people up in the plane for, for you know, you pay a fee and then you can ride in the plane with them, you know, for, for an hour or so. Uh, so that helped mitigate some of the costs of, of living in, in, in New York City. Um, and also, there was not, you know, New York was not the only place that had float planes. Um, the Pan American Flying Clipper in South America went to Florida. And it was also the China Clipper, which was on the West Coast. It went to uh, across the Pacific to, uh, to China and uh, points east. Nice diagram of the Yankee Clipper uh, showing... Uh, its internal structure, the seating, the various accommodations, the sleep, the food, uh, where the flight crew uh, section. Um, and you can see it's an enormous, enormous airplane. Even by today's standards, it's a huge plane. Uh, Yankee Clipper flying boat. As I said, 12 Clippers were built, nine that served Pan Am. Now, this is another interesting story. During World War II, the uh, 
Army um, and the Navy needed uh, trained um, pilot mechanics to train a cadre of soldiers to repair airplanes. So they hired 40 women to do the service at the airport, to, to you know, to work in the hangars, to repair, overhaul the planes, what have you. And again, here's another story, you know, of uh, of this this group that really did exemplary service. I do not recall reading any airplane that crashed or ran into any sort of problems under their care. And you know, if you talk to certain people, and uh, my my mother, for example, worked in, in a factory during World War II, and they were very proud of their work, and they did really wonderful work. Again, there is no monument. We have no idea who these ladies were or anything like that. We just have a, a passing reference. There should be something you know, to uh, out there um, lauding the dedication um, that they had breaking barriers of working on these, you know, the, some of the, the, the largest airplanes that existed up to that time. And and they were doing, you know, letter perfect work on these on these planes, maintenance work. The Model 130 on the left, there was only a handful of them built. They were all uh, were destroyed uh, accidentally. Uh, or they crashed. The Martin Morris is the one that I talked about. There was a there was about a dozen of those were built, and I think up until recently, two of them were used for um, uh, putting out fires because they're huge hauls. The planes would fly over a pond and fill up their tanks as they would fly, and then close the doors and then go over a fire and open up the doors. Uh, they had huge capacities. They're not uh, airworthy now, but they they still exist. There's still still two bars. Uh, planes in existence. Um, a lot of uh, stuff happened around the airports besides uh, the, you know, the fact that they were a, a destination or that the people would take off or they were doing revolution, revolutionary work in terms of uh, transport of people and goods over long distances in timely fashion. The, the, air, the airport industry, the, the, the airline industry, the service industries all around the air, 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 the air industry was um, springing up in Queens. And we're going to talk about some of the, the, the aircraft models, some of the, the air fields that were in that location. Um, there's a lot of, lot of history here. Sikorsky. Of course, everybody associates Sikorsky with the helicopters. But Sikorsky also built airplanes. He had LWF company, College Point. And he also had a seaplane company on College Point in the 1920s. So this was, he did uh, airplanes, aircraft, fighter aircraft, patrol aircraft for, for the First World War. And he did airplanes, sea seaplanes in the 1920s. And in um, College Point was another, uh, or Long Island City was another plant, Wright Martin. That uh, the built airplanes. You can see the Queensboro Magazine, which is the uh, magazine of uh, the uh, of commerce in the borough of Queens. Uh, it's, it's still being published by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, had a, a, a whole section on airplane airline production in Queens. Um, and this is an interesting one. This is the World War II, the Brewster Buffalo. You hear a lot of different stories about the Buffalo. It was built in Long Island City. Uh, at the Brewster building. And uh, it's, it's how interesting how history turns because the, the Brewster building has another airline that operates out of it today. And I'm not going to mention the name, but uh, you, uh, you can uh, uh, shout out the name to it. We'll do a little quiz. Okay. Other airports in Queens. Now, there are people who have done research, and I've linked the research that's done. A lot of the stuff's a labor of love. You take a look at this one here, www.airfieldsfreeman.com. Check out its section on air, airplanes in Queens. Um, and it, it's just extraordinary, the, the amount of research that people did on this. It's a labor of love. And if you go on these, these websites, if you find this stuff interesting, send them an email. Thank them for their work. Because... Without this kind of um, dedication to uh, the, the 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 this industry, um, much of this information probably would be permanently lost. So a lot of it's pretty near the the the, the surface because of uh, a, a lot of work by people that either had a hand in the industry or the family members 
or did the research to uh, to keep this the dream and uh, the, the the narrative alive. Of course, three major airports in New York, LaGuardia was the most centrally located, had waterfront access, but Newark and JFK were larger. JFK had the international flights. So every airport had a sort of specialty in the New York area. But this is just the top. There are many other facilities, and we're going to examine them quickly as we go through here. Flushing Airport. Okay. Um, Flushing Airport was actually uh, predated uh, being a major airport um, Curtis Field, because it was a larger, it was actually the largest airport in Queens uh, in the 1920s. But it had some problems. The, the, the location of it was in a marsh. Uh, so it was always a problem in terms of expanding um, the airfield, whereas uh, North Beach Airport, uh, you had much more land there. So you could, you know, and you also had the uh, Marine Terminal. So very quickly, Flushing Airport was eclipsed by its sister uh, across Flushing Bay. So there's Flushing Airport. And as you can see, there's there's LaGuardia Airport. And also what finally killed it was not only that the, 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 the runway uh, became waterlogged, but also there was so much flying um, that they had to start to restrict the, the flight patterns around LaGuardia Airport. Um, so that this other airport, which was right here, uh, the, the planes could only approach it from one direction and had to leave from the same direction. And finally, by the 1980s, they really clamped down on on private air, airplanes, you know, sending them out to, uh, you know, New Jersey, further out to Long Island, a place like Teterboro, what have you. So the um, they basically shut down Flushing Airport. Um, and I think uh, until very recently, there were still some some remnants Uh, Holmes Airport was another early airport, 1920s. Um, they did uh, they did some flying there of um, you know, training, uh, but again, it was a small airport right next to North Beach, and, and North Beach really took all the focus of um, you know of the of the airline industry. Uh, so it was kind of a, a small airport. It did have a blimp facility there, uh, and so the the blimps, which is could be used for advertising, you know, in Manhattan. Um, but it, basically, it, 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 the airport only lasted for a few years and then uh, and then shut down. Uh, the Rockaways have uh, a number of airports. Um, oh, one of the reasons I think that uh, Rockaways was was popular for airports was that the the government was very concerned about um during the war um you know the the u-boats and uh in, in world war ii there was even some talk that you know the the the, the germany was developing jets jet bombers that could cross the atlantic and get here before they we, we even knew what was happening drop of bombs on manhattan and head back so they really didn't know how to respond to these concerns so they had Facilities like this. This was a small airport. It was only around for about uh, 17 years, but it has a designation NOLF, and that stood for Naval Outlying Landing Field. And this was a series of flight places that had, were designated because they had low traffic location and were excellent for flight training if you needed to train a bunch of people quickly. Uh, to do patrols and stuff like that. So that was a designation. So it was more of a, you can see government approved school. So it was more of a place where, you know, people could learn uh, to to fly. Um, it was an out of the way place there. Uh, and also someone had said that when they built a junior high school next to the airport, they knew at that point that the airport's days were were, were numbered. Uh, Fort Tilden, Blimpfield. Now there, the forts, uh, there were forts Along the uh, the waterfront, um, you know, since the War of eighteen twelve, uh, the 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 waterfront, uh, well, you know, had to had to have some sort of a protection uh, from you know fleets sailing in, um, and uh, they uh, put a series of of forts that stretched from New Jersey through Staten Island, the harbor, Governor's Island, and then uh, in Brooklyn. 
and the Rockaways. Uh, Fort Tilden is one of the earliest forts, and they upgraded themselves from having uh, siege guns, basically, to, to hold off a fleet, to having blimps, which could do patrols, because they, now they were concerned about submarines that could, you know, um, attack, uh, you know, a, a, a merchant ship, because a lot of activity, a lot of war work was going on in, in New York. So they uh, set up a blimp facility in 1919, um, after the war was over, um, in case there'd be another another problem in the future. Uh, and they also had uh, facilities there of training. Uh, uh, they had uh, planes that could um, fly pontoons and, and land in the water. So um, later, it was upgraded when uh, World War II came in to the Rockaway Naval Station, where they put in batteries of, of cannon, which they took from some of the uh, fortresses that were further in the inner harbor, and they moved the cannon out to the, the Rockaways. Um, these guns were never used in action. Uh, they were later replaced by Nike missiles in the 1950s and 60s. And then uh, with the advent of satellites and submarines and what have you, the Nike the missiles themselves became obsolete. And the military decided to um, relinquish any control over uh, the uh, beaches. And in the 1970s, they started turning this space over to, uh, to uh, government, uh, either the state or the city. Uh, and now they're they're made into parks or what have you. You can still see some of the uh, uh, places where the guns were um, were mounted. Some of the concrete bases of the where the guns were mounted. But now this place is is a place of uh, you know uh, vacation destination spots with a, with a wonderful wonderful beach there. Uh, Jamaica's Air Seaport was the last place. It was one of the last ones, actually, that was put in in the 1920s. It really didn't last that long. Um, one of the problems was the uh, the uh, the airport was, was very, very small. It, the area was very swampy, um, and it was kind of difficult to land planes there. One of the ways that they got around it is that they actually had planes, seaplanes, where you could take off and land in the water. And that's what on the left is there. There's a pin that we have from uh, somebody that uh, ran uh, one of the flight uh, places there. But you can see it was only there for about 10 years. And it uh, was taken over by the city. It was uh, sort of on public lands um, and uh, became one of the uh, locations that uh, became part of Idlewild Airport later uh, in the next decade. Holly Bennett Field um, was failed as an airport. The, the idea was actually to have Floyd Bennett Field as New York City's airport. The problem was it was too far away and access to it was very difficult. Uh, you had uh, Flatbush Avenue, which was a perpetual traffic jam from the East River until like Brooklyn College and beyond. Um, and then, of course, you had the Belt Parkway, but that was, uh, you know, no commercial traffic on that. So it was kind of isolated. It was that famous story, of course, of LaGuardia when he had his ticket. It's in New York and he landed in, in Newark and he um, refused to. He said, no, he said, I'm going to New York. And they um, actually he landed here at Floyd Bennett Field. It was a naval facility, I think, at the time. Um, and again, this was held by the military until the 1970s when it was relinquished. And now it's part of uh, the Great Gateway Recreation Area, all this series of parks along the waterfront. And of course, no discussion of uh, the uh, air airports in Queens would be complete without mentioning JFK Airport or Idlewild Airport, um, which, uh, as you can see, uh, even as early as the 1950s, had a rather impressive array of overseas uh, air service air airlines that uh, would use that as their uh, as their home base in New York. Uh, it's the largest airport. It has 21 million passengers in a typical year. Now, quick history of LaGuardia. Uh, these are the earliest known photographs of North Beach Airport, taken in the 1930s on the right. And on the left is a, the first one of the first seaplanes at the airport. You can see a very simple uh, device. It looks like it has maybe one or two propellers. It's not the big seaplanes that we saw uh, that uh, took off later 
in a few years. This was 1936. In the background, you can see all kinds of equipment for uh, measuring the uh, the wind direction or what have you. Uh, and again, uh, you can look at these websites, metroairportnews.com, and they actually have um, stories about uh, some of these uh, early airports, including North Beach. Fabulous collection of North Beach's early years. And you can see now a development of infrastructure, floodlights for night service on the left. On the right, you're starting to get now a permanent grounds crew working at the airport. And by the 1930s, um, the, the, it, the, the, the foundation was, was laid in place for the modern uh, air, air, airports uh, in, in New York. Uh, the city of New York airports, number one, number two, um, in 1935, Floyd Bennett Field was still number one, but right next to it, number two was uh, North Beach. And there's also talks about the seaplane bases, so Wall Street, 31st Street. Um, you know, so there, there was there, this. This was the, really the beginning of of the modern age of the airport. Uh, and on the right, you can see the American Airlines and their brochure from this time period, and they would become late the world's largest airline when they measured by fleet size, scheduled passengers, and revenue passenger miles. Uh, we have some collections in our collection. The um, opening ceremonies for the New York Municipal Airport number two, 1939. And there are some really incredible pictures of the uh, building of the hangars. Um, this is the plans for the New York Airlines, their, their hangars. And this is a really, really nice little picture here of the, uh, there's the Empire State Building. And there's a plane flying over Manhattan. And oh my, right next to it is the airport. So it looks like the airport is literally um, just a mid-turn and, and you can just land, which isn't really, when you look at it, too far away from the truth. Uh, and again, uh, the, the government was subsidizing air travel with uh, the uh, air mail. Uh, and we have North Beach Airport's World's Fair Airmail, 1939. Um, first scheduled flight, December 1939. And here we have the mayor of LaGuardia himself creating a stewardess. Um, fabulous picture of the Pan Am Strato Clipper in 1940. Um, they went to, as you can see, LaGuardia, Chicago, Kansas City, Albuquerque, and Bur Burbank. Took him 14 hours, one direction, 12 hours the next. Raymond Lowy designed the interior. Lowy was the outstanding industrial designer of the time. Uh, he provided sleep accommodations for the planes. And uh, he worked on other, a lot of other industry um, things, such as the Studebaker automobile. Even worked for NASA. He had a 70-year uh, a uh, career in industrial design. Uh, two interesting photos about a decade apart showing the, the enormous growth of uh, North Beach Airport, uh, LaGuardia Field from 1935 and 1946. And here you see the, the runway, the planes taking off and landing. And for those of you who I'm sure have had the experience in the Grand Central Parkway and planes landing overhead, you can actually feel the, uh, the air press down on the car as the plane flies over. It's a pretty interesting. There's a uh, a whole uh, series of, uh, there's a bunch of blocks to the uh, south that's uh, part of the flight path for the and lights in it, which is used for the uh, when the, the landing of the, of the planes. It's really, really interesting. In the post-war period, um, all these GIs who flew on the planes, worked on the planes, uh, came back and had, uh, no qualms about flying on planes anymore. And so they would take their families on vacation. And this was the beginning of the modern flight period where no longer it was an elite service, but it was something that uh, every person uh, felt comfortable taking. And it's changed. You know, at the beginning, you had these uh, exclusive dining facilities by the New Yorker. And uh, by the you know, 50s and 60s, you had something like this, the Sky Bar, where they had a, a, a menu that included Hot dogs. LaGuardia Airport, 1948. This was the year that the Port Authority assumed responsibility for operations and development at both LaGuardia and Idlewild Airport. Now, here you're starting to see more and more planes on the field. And 
And there's the main departure building. This is actually, I think this is the uh, Marine Air Terminal. The building is absolutely stunning. It looks like from this picture, it looks like it was built just last year. Uh, and you can see why it was designated as a uh, as a historic site and a New York City landmark. Take a look at 1953. What do we see? Well, we still see the um, promenade where people can see the planes take off. But the real the real in uh, interest here is the number of airplanes that are taxiing uh, or are in place along that promenade, a huge change over just a 15 year period, when it to have maybe four or five planes sitting there. Here, the airport now, again, in 1960, you'd see the the various, uh, the planes now, they, they have their own uh, walk, uh, walkways on them, and every walkway has a number of planes that are attached to it. Uh, and of course, years later, not in, near, in the 70s and 80s, this circular area had a, a multi-layer parking lot. And if you take a look at Grand Central Parkway, which had a couple of cars, now has how many lanes going back and forth? 1960. So this, this area was really being developed into uh, the modern airport uh, that we know of, of today. And yet, even at this time, you could still find echoes of an early, early, early earlier time. This is Eleanor Roosevelt. She's walking to a plane carrying her luggage in 1960. She would have been doing that in 1942. So it's really interesting. Of course, today, the uh, the wife of the president uh, would have an entire entourage, um, you know, walking with them on, on, on a flight. So it's really, really interesting how things have changed over time. And speaking of things changing over time, sometimes you got to freeze it with a time lapse photo like this to really get a real spirit of how things kind of flow. Um, the building on the right is that famous tower is put up in 1960. Now, there's a story there, too. So many stories around this airport. Uh, this was built by a guy named Wallace Harrison. Now, I think he was related to one of the Rockefellers. He might have been a brother in law or something like that. So he, he had a ton of really high profile commissions. I mean, the Rockefeller Center, the UN, Lincoln Center. It worked on the World's Fair, 64 World's Fair. And this this was his uh, his uh, his uh, gift to the uh, the flying community at LaGuardia Airport, the tower from 1960, which was there up until um, just a, a couple of years ago. Um, this is now we're at almost the modern airport. Uh, this is early 1980s. And you can see now the, the, the huge runway expansion. This is Rikers Island. So you can see the runway expansion here uh, compared to the earlier uh, photos uh, of this of this airport and drawings. And, you know, it, it's just continuously going through a series of changes at the at the airport evolving um, as, as the public's flight experience. And it was a great, great article that came out um, in the New York Times earlier this year about uh, the airport and some of the uh, uh, some of the changes to it and, and, and what we expect with the completion. Um, I'm just going to go through this again. This is stuck at the airport.com. This is a fabulous article by Harriet Baskus on called Dazzling Milestone for New York's LaGuardia Airport. And it talks about some of the, you know, the technical changes that they're looking at for the airport, some of the changes that are being made, some of the ideas for the future. Now, here, this is interesting. Instead of using the uh, the, air, the airport as a uh, to, to to take off a seaplane, they're talking now about having people arrive at the airport instead of chalking up or you know, clocking bridges and expressways and what have you, you know, boarding a, a boat in Manhattan and taking a boat to the airport directly. And in the background there, you see the Marine Air Terminal. Now, you can imagine what this place would look like in this kind of environment. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the terminal at the very end here, because I think there's some really wonderful possibilities that can be associated with this space. But we'll hold this off until towards the end here. Uh, this is the new 850,000 square foot Terminal B and Arrivals Departure Hall. Again, compare this to the promenade in the 1940s postcard. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, and there's still people today that you know might have walked on that promenade that now are taking the airport on something like this within a lifetime. The changes are enormous.
Uh, you know, again, people are looking at the future. Is this what the airport's going to look like now? No, maybe. But is it going to look like this in the future? Perhaps, who knows? We are limited only by our imagination when it comes to things such as the, the, the place like the aviation, the travel, and this airport. And you can see over time with this talk how things have changed here, how so many different facets have fit together into an absolutely fascinating narrative. Look at the retail dining concessions. It's just absolutely legendary, future dining concessions. Look at the state-of-the-art checking and baggage claims. Now, compare that to the 1940s or the 1960s or even 1980s, what we have here today. State-of-the-art, folks. Look at the artwork. LaGuardia's Vistas refer to the airport's founder, the mayor of LaGuardia. Impressive new public art exhibits. Art pieces. So no longer is the flying experience a drab experience, a place where you sort of get through it to get to another location. It becomes an experience in itself. It is a triumph of human spirit and ingenuity. From the earliest times, the earliest people in aviation left their footprints here at this airport. And that leads us to now Terminal A, a proposal, a suggestion. So maybe we can consider making this an education or tourist center. This is the Marine Air Terminal as it looks today. This, when you walk through the um, rotunda, the waiting area, and you look above your head, this is what you see. Now, I've walked through a lot of New York. I'm involved in a lot of tours, preservation, a, you know, a lot of discussions with a lot of people. We write books. What makes New York great? If somebody would ask me to put together a list of the top 10 things in New York that you could see, this would be very high on that list. Imagine a young kid walking into this place, you know, and wondering about the flight that he's about to go on. And then with his family and him looking up and seeing something like that and gets an impression that you never will forget. The Marine Air Terminal was um, designated as a landmark uh, in November of 1980. And it was on the National Register in July of 1982. These documents say some really interesting, important things I want to share with you, a few sentences. The handsome room contains the circular mural flight by James Brook, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, the Marine Air Terminal is only two terminals in this country from the first generation of flight. It has continued in operation despite great changes in aviation over the past 40 years, testifies to the quality of its design. It remains today an exceptional example of the Art Deco style and of a building type unique to the 20th century. And I'll sort of conclude now talking about this fabulous mural, Flight by James Brook. It is considered by far the largest WPA mural ever painted. Uh, it's 12 feet high and almost 240 feet long. It is a mural that depicts the history of flight from the earliest times when uh, the, 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 the people would sit there and, and look at watch birds fly and wonder about the magic of how that was possible through the myths of ancient Greece and Rome through the Middle Ages, through Da Vinci, through the Wright brothers, and today. That uh, is a bust of LaGuardia, by the way, that's inside this uh, space here. Uh, as you can see, it mirrored the flow. So there on the left, you have from the earliest times of people seeing birds flying and wondering how this is possible through the myths and through Da Vinci and the Wright brothers. And the culmination of this mural is man's dream, 
In the golden age of the flying boat with the Pan Am Clipper seaplanes to land on the water after a flight from Lisbon or Rio. Um, the narrative flows from the mythology to the Wright brothers. And one of my favorite parts of this is the pre-World War II aerial navigators plotting their routes with paper maps and rulers. No computers for these guys. It's slide rules and just gut instinct. And they were a success. And since this work of these people in this era, humanity has never touched the ground. The Marine Air Terminal. And this is a really fabulous picture showing its history, its place in history. Because you have the Yankee Clipper as a historical artifact. Those were the ships that sailed to all points around the world and showed the American flag and bought goods and brought them back to America, showing the world that we are a world power. And there we have the Marine Air Terminal having the Yankee Clipper, the flying boat, doing the same thing 100 years later. So it's history repeating itself. The Marine Air Terminal, Potential Education Aviation Heritage Center. That's what I think would be a great um, future for this place. What are your ideas? And uh, look at this beautiful map here from 1939 showing the original shoreline. This is actually a work of art. The original shoreline, there's the Marine Air Terminal, there's the various um, runways, there's the hangars, there's the main, the main terminal. Absolutely stunning work. Um, and uh, by the way, that uh, airport or their airline that is in, uh, it's running out of uh, the place in Queens Plaza where they made the, uh, the Brewster Buffaloes, that's JetBlue. Lecturer, Bob Singleton. My name is Bob Singleton, Executive Director of Great Astoria Historical Society, and you have just walked through some of the collections at our society, our website, www.astorialic.org. If you're interested, do get in touch with us, historialic at gmail.com. I'd love to chat with you about this. Um, this, I hope, is just the first step of some ideas uh, around the Marine Air Terminal. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful future for the airport. See you. See you on the flight, folks.